in fact pushed to. If they are without a sense of humor, they are likely to be grave, inflexible, and rigid, and not the sort of person with whom we could develop. So that, in all ways, it might be said that humor, perhaps, is in some sense the most serious thing we do. The question over here. Um, taking that, uh, uh, Dr. Miller says further, is not laughter and humor programmed into much human behavior? Later this month, I, with others, will go to a trade association lunch where the speaker is a raconteur. He will tell a lot of dubious stories. I, with the others, uh, enlightened with the claret or whatever mm. else it is, will doubtless laugh because I'm in an environment where I'm expected to laugh. Well, I think the, the question of, of jokes, in fact, I can just briefly outline my theory of jokes. I believe that jokes, as opposed to humour, are things which are impersonal. So that we, what we have are these rather shop-worn, dry-clean, second-hand goods which circulate around the community for the purpose of establishing some sort of conviviality in circumstances when we actually don't have spontaneous intimacy. And one of the reasons, I think, why men tell jokes with such remorseless uh, uh, <laughs> energy and why women really scarcely ever do tell jokes is that women get on much more readily with one another and can establish an intimacy with one another in ways that men can't. Men are much more ill at ease with one another when they don't know each other. And jokes are a sort of worn currency which they hand around in order to establish a conviviality. I remember sitting once in front on, a, on, a, on an aeroplane where there were four American Marines returning to boot camp in Alabama. And for the hour and a half of the flight, these Marines endlessly told jokes to one another. Now, I should say one out of five of those jokes actually amused the others. But nevertheless, there was an elaborate performance in which the others felt obliged to simulate laughter in order not to break down the convivium which the joke exchanging was designed to establish. So that when the gag line was delivered, which wasn't a very funny one, which didn't actually spontaneously make them laugh, they went through the following elaborate performance. They went, God damn. <laughs> and they went through a performance of what they had obviously heard once before, the idea of rocking with silent laughter. Now, thank God there is a denomination of rocking with silent laughter, because you haven't got to go through the unconvincing performance of actually rocking with uh, audible laughter. But nevertheless, they somehow felt required. There was an obligation on the part of each of them to perform amusement in response to a joke which had been handed round. Otherwise, what would have been destroyed was the convivium which that joke uh, circulation was designed to establish. Uh, sorry, there was a, the, the question here at the front. Uh, all I was going to go back to is at the very beginning, and you suggested we all laugh nervously. I think laughter is infectious. You know, you can laugh and you can actually, you know, be absolutely hysterical with laughter because someone else next to you is laughing. Yeah, I think this is very difficult. I've never understood what it is, but it's, it's certainly true. Um, I mean, Nick and I were together in Lithuania. Uh, this is Nick Garland here from The Independent. And we actually had a, a, a moment when we were crossing a square in Vilna late one night, um, thinking how amusing it would be if there was a sketch which dealt with the moment when a group of SS officers were falling about with laughter, having just heard from German intelligence of the words to the Colonel Bogey march. Um, and at the moment when they are falling about helpless with laughter, the German high command walks in and says, what's so funny? Tell us, share it with us. You know, no, no, we can't say it, you know. But uh, No, no, you must share the joke with us. Uh, Hitler would be very amused by it. No, no, he wouldn't. Um, and they are then forced to go, to go through it. Well, the thing which really convulsed us and laid us actually on the floor of this square in Vilna was the idea that finally this this uh, soldier was so reluctant to tell the joke that he had to be taken down into the basement for the song to be tortured out of him. <laughs> we have ways of making you sing. <laughs> and also he'll help him having, or, or him beginning to tell the joke with a prophylactic Heil Hitler to show that he didn't mean what he was saying. <laughs> Apparently Hitler has only got, well, I don't think this myself, but, uh, and then of Hitler, the laugh vanishing from Hitler's face, Goering becoming helpless until, and Goering has two, but they are small. And it, gradually, the mirthlessness spread. So, I mean, we became completely helpless because we were infecting one another with this joke, but also with the laughter. And I don't know why it works.
but I wondered whether it isn't in fact a sort of luxury good. We talk, we tell jokes the whole time. We have complex systems, places where you can pay money, get a ticket, and someone will make you laugh. I wonder how much in very primitive, I wonder if cavemen, you know, napping away on their flints, nudge each other and tell jokes, I don't know. Do all societies tell jokes? Is it of all time, or is it, is it now? Well, um, joking, and not just simply joke exchanging, but, but playful amusement, which, which produces laughter, festive, jocular, subversive laughter, seems to be something which goes back to antiquity. Mm. And I think the reason why it's universal is that it reflects something which is deeply characteristic of human beings, which is not just simply that we enjoy this as a sort of luxury goods, but that it reflects something which is deeply characteristic of us and makes us very different from uh, animals. And that is the capacity to redraw our cognitive constitution. Now, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the biological payoff? Whenever pleasure is associated with an experience, particularly uh, pleasures which are so intense that we're uh, happy and willing to pay large amounts of money to have that experience administered to us, it must be that there's some sort of biological payoff. When pleasure is associated with something, we have to ask ourselves, what's in it for us? What's in it for the species? Because if you consider the two other uh, experiences with which pleasure is associated, it's quite clear what the biological payoff is. Pleasure is associated with sexual intercourse. Pleasure is associated with eating, and pleasure of a rather dubious sort is associated with emptying hollow, vis uh, hollow viscera of one sort or another if they are overfilled. <laughs> now, the reason why there is pleasure attached to sexual intercourse and to eating is that these are expensive activities in terms of expenditure of time and, and energy. Now, where there in fact to be no pleasure attached to these activities, you might overlook them altogether, or you might have to consult your philofax in order to remind yourself that it was time to have one of whatever it is, either a meal or a screw. <laughs> And if, in fact, you had to open your file of facts and said, good God, three months have gone by without, in fact, my having satisfied this appetite, and, of course, there's a payoff for the species. If a species or a, or a group became totally amnesiac with respect to sexual intercourse and or eating, the individual would die out and eventually the race would die out. And so I think the question we ought to ask ourselves is, is what is the biological payoff in having laughing matter administered to us? What, in fact, is the advantage? Now, what is going on in the case of, of, of laughter and humor is that we are experimenting with and rehearsing alternative categories um, for describing the world around us. And that um, it is this playful aspect in which we, as it were, um, alter the groupings and classes which we use to describe the world, which actually offers us the opportunity of altering our behavior. And that without this, if we did have uh, a cognitive inflexibility, which actually always bound us to precisely the same categories for describing the world, we would actually find it very, very hard to be the, uh, the sort of creative creatures that we are, to be as technically uh, flexible and versatile as we are. Am I being brought to a standstill? <laughs> Please wrap in three minutes. <laughs> Now, that, that's, now, why is that funny, you see? That, 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 I think it's funny because, in fact, uh, again, it breaks down a category. Those idiot boards are meant to be secret things which are taken in by the performer and meant to prompt uh, behavior without the audience being privy to them. So what I've done is to violate a fundamental uh, uh, category of etiquette. I have made uh, public something which is meant to be between me and the producer alone. Um, and with that, I suppose I'd better finish. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next week, at the later time of 9.50, QED...